Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, a pair of military memorials get the green light to break ground in the nation's capital. Find out which groups of service members will be honored. And a new set of Medals of Honor are set to be cast for five more heroic service members, plus upgrades for some of the troops who fought in Mogadishu. We'll also dive into why Pakistan bought a Chinese spider and get an industry update from our Middle East correspondent. Finally, the Military Times team of editors looks ahead to some of the biggest stories they expect to develop in the new year. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. The calendar has rolled over, but the news never stopped. And we've got a lot in store for you today. First up, plans for two new military memorials to be built in Washington, D.C. move forward just before the new year. On December 27th, President Joe Biden signed off on plans for memorials for both veterans of the global war on terrorism and for Medal of Honor recipients. While the monuments are still several years from construction, the bill's signing was an important step for both memorials. For more on the Medal of Honor Memorial, I spoke to Navy veteran Chris Cassidy, president of the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Andrea. Great to be with you. So on Monday, President Joe Biden signed into law a site for a National Medal of Honor tribute. What will this tribute be? Right, exactly. We're just very excited. We're, we're, he signed into law uh, authorizing the National Medal of Honor monument to be positioned on the, on the mall in Washington, D.C. It's the first step in constructing it, and that's what our project is set out to do. So what is the timeline and how is this going to happen? Well, that's a great question. So um, it's the first of a few steps where we don't have the exact site identified yet. We have that we're down to a few and uh, there's some more meetings and committees that will go through to work with the park services to determine the very specific uh, plot of land that it will be. We know generally down by the Lincoln Memorial uh, and, and then a, a design competition to, to, to understand what we're going to build and then the build process itself. So when you stretch all that out, we're still a few years away from, from uh, tourists in Washington, D.C. to be able to enjoy the monument there. But it's a very, very important first critical step. And how did this idea come about? Well, um, I work for what's called the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation. And the foundation really has three uh, prongs, if you will. One is the monument that we're talking about on the mall in DC. The other is a physical museum in Arlington, Texas, which is where I'm talking to you from. And housed in that museum will be the third aspect of the project, which is a leadership institute centered around the, the, the characteristics and the values that the Medal of Honor represents. And the National Medal of Honor recipients themselves, there's about 66 still alive. What do they think about this? Right, the 66 living recipients, uh, that they're our urgency to build uh, the monument in the museum. We want as many of those 66 to be able to stand in front of the, the monument, put their hand on it, uh, walk through the halls of the museum, present a class to a, a group of of school children in our leadership institute or or uh, or or adults whatever uh, that's that's our urgency that's our effort what is it about this tribute that you're most excited about well you know i'm i'm most excited to um, to really bring medal of honor recipients more to the public's knowledge by that i mean uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you in the Dallas area. I think a lot of people around here could name more starting um, uh, members of the Dallas Cowboy football team than they could 
Medal of Honor recipients. And I wanted, I'm excited to be part of an effort that will change that. You know, if, if people come into our museum or walk uh, around the monument in DC, if they walk away knowing uh, one or two or five names of, of recipients that they didn't know prior to that, that that's a win as far as I'm concerned. Great, Chris. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Andrea. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And the moves to recognize military heroism keep coming. Just before the New Year, Congress gave the green light for five more Medals of Honor to be awarded and approved upgrades for troops who fought in the 1993 Battle of Mogadishu, made famous in the movie Black Hawk Down. Military Times' Leo Shane brings us more. In the annual defense authorization bill approved by Congress last month, lawmakers included several noteworthy upgrades to individual veterans' military honors. Among those are five soldiers who are now eligible to receive the Medal of Honor, pending a final review by the Pentagon and the White House. All five men would be recognized for actions that occurred more than five decades ago. Private First Class Wadaru Nakamura served in World War II, Private Bruno Orig and Private First Class Charles Johnson were heroes in the Korean War, and Specialist Dennis Fugi and Staff Sergeant Edward Kenoshira are being recognized for valor during the Vietnam War. In December, President Joe Biden similarly celebrated three Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans with medals of honor for actions they, ha they had received lesser recognition in the past. Now, in addition to those medals, four service members who fought in the Battle of Mogadishu in 1993 would see their existing honors upgraded to the Distinguished Service Cross after lawmakers determined their heroism had not been properly recognized. The decision follows similar moves last summer when the Army upgraded 60 medals for special operators who took part in that battle. For Military Times, I'm Leo Shane. Thanks, Leo. That's it from the military this week. When we come back, we'll learn about which defense tech Russia is interested in buying from the Middle East. The military and defense market is constantly evolving. Stay on top of the latest news with Sightline Media Group's live events. Continue to learn, understand new tools and technologies. We're live, you're on in three. Defense, two, government, one. and industry leaders come together for successful and proven engaging events. You'll gain valuable insight, get the chance to ask questions, all from the comfort of your own home or office. Sign up for our events newsletters and receive alerts for upcoming live streams. Agnes, welcome back to the show. There's a lot of Russian interest in the Middle East on the business side with a lot of products, in particular one that could actually be a little bit of a competition with the American F-35, and that's the Checkmate. Tell us what we're looking at. After the uh, Russian companies made an assessment for the Middle East market, they found out that there is an increasing demand for fifth-generation uh, fighters. That's why Rustic, in particular, offered the UAE to co-produce subparts of the uh, Su-75 Checkmate fighter in particular. So they're not only offering the fighter to the Middle East, but also co-production with some factories in the United Arab Emirates, and that, that could make it a little bit more of an attractive offer for the UAE? Exactly. In line with Vision 2030 in the UAE, the UAE uh, aims to get the production to 50% local production of any technology. That's why uh, Russia hit this point and is trying to help to agree with the UAE to co-produce this checkmate. Uh, it held talks with Mubadala, it held talks with Tawazan Economic Council, also with Edge Conglomerate to co-produce subparts, specifically the, the composite material, which Mubadala is uh, very known of, and also the uh, telecommunications. I know the United Arab Emirates has been interested in the American F-35. Is this, is this a little bit of a switch? Are they interested now on the Russian, on the Russian checkmate? Not exactly. This is not a switch. The UAE is holding talks with both parties. It has expressed its interest more than one time, and it went into negotiations to, and signed also a contract with the U.S. in order to get 50 F-35 uh, uh, fighters. However, there is an issue or concern for the U.S. about the fifth 
uh, 5G Huawei telecommunications, whereby the Huawei is cooperating with Do in the UAE for telecommunications. And that's why the UAE had uh, suspended the talks and the interest with the US for F-35s uh, in order to settle this matter. Regarding the Su-75 uh, and the checkmate in particular, since Russia is offering a lot and especially the co-production in alignment with the Vision 2030, there is really big competition, regardless of the operational effectiveness or anything, noting that the checkmate is still in its experimental phase. It has not been uh, into the production lines. And um, to assure how much the Russia puts uh, significance on the UAE, Russia made the debut of the Checkmate in MAX 2021 in Russia, and the Checkmate made its first international showcase in the UAE at Dubai Air Show. It was for the first time out, outside Russia at Dubai in the UAE. Is, is this going to be a big competition against the, the, the F-35? Should, should Lockheed Martin be worried? Of course not. Maybe this is not a competition. This may be just to put pressure on the administration, the U.S. administration, to move forward, regardless of the cooperation with China. So a little bit of a history lesson with uh, a couple of years ago with Turkey. They, they were in the F-35 program. They, they wanted this jet. They went ahead and bought Russian air defense system, the S-400, which prohibited them from moving forward with the F-35 system. Presumably, if a company buys the Checkmate, they can also buy the S-400 air defense system. Is that something that is attractive to the United Arab Emirates? Maybe. We're not sure yet. However, if this is just a uh, a step to put pressure on the U.S. administration, this has been also uh, done earlier by Saudi Arabia for the S-400 when it couldn't get the uh, missile defense and air defense systems from the U.S. It signed a contract with Russia for S-400 systems. However, Defense News knew lately that uh, this deal was uh, called off and the KSA lost any interest in S-400 after it got the FAD, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System. So this may be just a similar step to put pressure to get what they need from the systems in the, uh, from the U.S. The United Arab Emirates has no shortage of friends, it looks like. And Russia is selling to to the entire Middle East. Are there any other Middle Eastern countries that are interested, particularly in Russian equipment? Yes, it seems that most of the Gulf countries and the Middle East countries are trying to fill in the gaps where they cannot get specific uh, arms from the U.S. or from Western countries, speaking about France and other European countries. They are trying to fill it from the East, speaking about Russia and China. Also, there is also North uh, South Korea. They are trying to get uh, systems like Egypt is trying to procure the uh, K9 Thunder, uh, also to co-produce it with the North uh, with South Korea and uh, Turkey. They are trying to get some uh, drones from Turkey, some countries. So there there is cooperation to fill in the gaps with many other countries. And Agnes, if I know you, will be covering all those deals every step of the way on DefenseNews.com. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack talks you through retirement savings accounts. When the clock strikes midnight on the new year, millions of Americans start resolving to save more, pay down debt, or raise their credit score. Three things you can absolutely do in the new year. It just takes a new perspective and maybe an out-of-the-box plan of attack. First, be smarter about setting goals. Make them attainable. You're not going to save a million bucks or get an 800 credit score in 12 months. But what you can do is save a little money a lot. Make it something like a bill you have to pay monthly and set up automatic deposits to an account that you don't touch. Did you finish paying off a loan? Make that payment your new savings amount or use it to pay down your highest debt. And it may sound like bad advice, but if you haven't set a budget by now, let's not. Instead, start tracking your spending. Knowing exactly where your money goes might stop you from paying for things you shouldn't, like that streaming entertainment service you never watch. And make financial apps your friend. They can help track not just your spending, but your savings and your credit score. There are even some aimed at helping you break into stock investment. The tools to success are out there. By shifting your thinking, spending, and saving, there's no way you can't become the money manager you've always wanted to be this year. 
Thanks, Jeanette. We'll check back in with you next week. In the meantime, if you want more in-depth military and defense coverage, check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And to get a list of top stories in your inbox every weekday, subscribe to the Early Bird Brief. And why not give us a follow on Facebook and Twitter? It's free. If you want to check out some of the history in our nation's capital but can't travel, don't worry. We've got you covered. We're planning to have a live tour of Alexandria National Cemetery on YouTube next week. So mark your calendars for Wednesday, January 12th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. You'll get to ask questions of Alexandria City Historian and learn about the process that allowed black soldiers to be buried there. If you want to ask questions, be sure to subscribe to Military Times' YouTube. You can turn on the reminder for that stream and get updated on any schedule changes and future streams. And when we come back, the Military Times team of editors looks ahead to what they expect to be tracking as some of the biggest stories in 2022. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It's that time of year when reporters and editors gaze into their crystal balls and try to divine the top stories that will dominate the headlines in the months to come. In this week's Reporters Roundtable, the Military Times team looks ahead at what we'll all be talking about in 2022. Check it out. Welcome back to the Military Times Reporters Roundtable, where we bring you the inside stories behind the week's biggest headlines. I'm Leo Shane, Capitol Hill Bureau Chief for Military Times, and with me in studio again are our Pentagon Bureau Chief, Megan Myers, and our Senior Managing Editor, Howard Altman. Thank you both for coming back. Thanks for having us. We covered the biggest stories of 2021 in our last episode. Now it's time to start looking ahead at what's in store for 2022. I asked each of you to bring a topic you think we're going to be covering a lot. Howard, you brought in uh, Ukraine, Russia, the tensions that are over there right now. Talk to us about what, where things stand. The uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Defense recently told me that there's about 120,000 Russian troops aligned around the Ukraine border. Previously, their uh, head of their Defense Intelligence Agency told me that uh, the uh, Russians are preparing an invasion by the end of January, beginning of February. It's really unknown yet what uh, Vladimir Putin's going to do. The U.S. has said that there's not going to be U.S. troops involved should Ukraine invade. The um, Biden administration said that's not going to happen. The, and, and still unknown what uh, Vladimir Putin's going to yeah, do. They, they keep promising these severe consequences, but saying that U.S. troops are off the table. So. I mean, they're talking about economic um, sanctions on bank accounts, that kind of thing, additional arms to Ukraine. But, Megan, if, if we're not sending troops there, does this mean this is nothing for the Pentagon to worry about? Um, I mean, that doesn't mean that some sort of outside contingency won't happen. But, yeah, like Howard mentioned, like you mentioned, you know, there are troops in the area. We have sent weapons to Ukraine. The Defense Department feels pretty good about its posture there. Um, but, you know, we really don't know, except that the administration has made it very clear that, that they're not really st stepping a toe into that, really. They want the diplomatic process to play out. Well, Megan, something you've already been covering and something that I know we're going to be covering more is this issue of the ongoing pandemic and the, the mandatory vaccinations for troops. Get, tell us where we are at this point with this. Where, where do things stand and are we starting to see folks who are being kicked out? We are. Um, actually, 27 airmen are about to be kicked out of the Air Force, the first kind of wave um, of service members who are being voluntarily separated for refusing to get vaccinated. There are about 40,000-ish troops who still aren't vaccinated, but that's also in the context of the, the National Guard and the Army Reserve, the Army National Guard, excuse me, and the Army Reserve um, are about half a million people and they don't, they have until the end of June to get fully vaccinated. But everybody else um, in the services has had, has missed their deadline basically at this point if they're still not, um, you know, they don't have a waiver or something like that. So each of the services has their own process playing out for how they're going to identify people and then eventually um, kick them out. Yeah, 40,000 sounds like a lot of folks and I know we focus on that, but that's, I mean, that's a very small portion of the military. There here. are 2.3 million people in the military and most of the services, especially in the active duty components, you know, upwards of 95 percent, 97 percent of their troops are vaccinated um, and then they will have several thousand more waivers to go through mm -hmm. uh, before that number is complete. But that small, that small group still gets a lot of attention. Howard, I know on Capitol Hill, they just recently passed language in the Defense Authorization Act that would make sure that folks get uh, honorable discharges or at least uh, not, not dishonorable discharges uh, if they refuse to take the vaccines. I mean, 
Is this just, this, this seems pretty straightforward. We've, we know the science behind the vaccines. We know the, the, the mandate from Defense Department. Are we just, are, do, you, do you think we're going to see large numbers of people get, being forced out of the military for refusing this? Well, as Megan said, there's a, there's a small percentage, but still there are numbers of people, and you will continue to see people oppose. Recently, the uh, executive officer of the destroyer Churchill was fired for refusing to take the vaccine. There are lawsuits against the Pentagon trying to get out of the vaccine. There are National Guard units that have uh, raised issues about that. So you will continue to see a level of protest against the mandate. Has the, Megan, has the Pentagon grabbed onto that? Do they feel like we're, as in the media, elevating these folks who are refusing the vaccine to, to a level that makes it seem like it's a crisis when maybe it's just a, an annoyance? Absolutely. The, the, and this comes out of Congress, too, but that, the insinuation that losing uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000 troops is really going to you know, destroy readiness throughout the military, that's not really, that, that's not really likely. The other thing is that the Pentagon is really taking the stance of not uh, of being the good cop and trying to show why you should do this and why it's good instead of saying we're you know you'll get kicked out. But they, that's not what they're leading with because they want people to do the right thing and they don't want contrarians to dig in. So they're trying to make it as you know smooth as this is a lawful order and this is you know and you will follow it and if you don't there will be consequences. They're trying not to push too hard because they don't want that huge backlash of people saying well you know. I, you, you, you're making me do something I don't want to do. And so, you know, we're all leaving. Well, you mentioned Congress. Let's shift to Capitol Hill, where I live, and the midterm elections that are looming this fall. Uh, it doesn't look like military issues are going to be a major uh, factor in the elections. But one thing that is going to be significant is the Pentagon watching um, what happens with the defense budget. Uh, as of right now, Congress still hasn't finalized the fiscal 22 defense budget, even though next fiscal, the, the current fiscal year started all the way back in October. Lawmakers avoided the government shutdown in recent weeks, but they won't reach a full year budget deal to the end of February. That's around the same time the White House is supposed to come out with their 2023 deal. This is, this is yet another budget mess up on Capitol Hill and something that's really frustrating. Um, and there's a lot of questions about what the defense budget should be this year, next year, post Afghanistan. Um, this is, this is going to be a, a big issue. So, so Leo, what's the, what is the danger for the, the uh, military as this budget process is delayed and the two budget processes are actually bumping up against each yeah, other. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen so far is that there's a lot of uncertainty of what they even should be asking for next year because they don't they don't know what they're they're spending right now. And this issue of, you know, the, the defense budget is huge. There's still a lot of money, but they can't start new programs. They can't uh, expand programs. They can't buy certain new equipment without the new money coming in. They're still working on fiscal 2020, 2021 levels. So until that's sorted out, uh, there's a question. We've seen in the last few weeks that uh, defense leaders have been coming out and saying, hey, if you're going to extend the budget the whole year, if you do a continuing resolution for the whole year, that's going to cause huge problems. We already know it's starting to cause some problems with uh, funding for the military pay raise. Military pay raise went into effect on January 1st, but about $250 billion, a million dollars they've got to account for by, by moving around accounts. So, so that's interesting. Usually when we come here and we talk about election stuff, uh, you know, it's uh, the getting out of Afghanistan or Iraq and everything. I, I'll be really interested to see if the defense budget becomes uh, a big issue in and at least a talking point on the campaign trail in the Imag coming months. I imagine it will be because it'll be right on when people are starting a campaign. Well, there's always 19 other things to yell and scream about on there, too. So, look, one other thing before we go, uh, another big story that's that I, I wanted to discuss with both of you this year. That's the uh, long scheduled release of Top Gun 2, uh, probably the most important cinematic event of the military community in years and years. The movie's debut has been delayed for uh, uh, for more than a year because of the pandemic, but it looks like we're finally going to get to see it. Uh, Megan, you've covered the Navy for us. Do, give us an analysis. Do you think that this is going to be the realistic depiction that we need of the Navy, or is there another movie, say, I don't know, Aquaman 2, that really better reflects the Navy life? You know, I think there may be a little bit of backlash, a little bit of, you know, that's, uh, Maverick's not necessarily the greatest role model, and at this oh, bite your tongue. At this point in his career, you know he would be retiring. He would be a four-star admiral at this point. But the way that they've set up this movie is that he's kind of like a malingering captain who never made admiral, and it's his last chance before you know he times out. So we'll see how he does. But I don't want any you know I don't want any other Navy officers to get the idea that you can just malinger at captain for years and years. Howard, this this movie's coming out in May, which gives you five months to see the original Top Gun because you made the mistake of admitting you have not seen it, which I feel like is just a, a dereliction of duty as a military journalist here. Hey, I'm, I'm feeling a need for speed. 
That's the only line you know from the movie. That's all you've got. The danger zone. We'll get you we're working on that. the danger zone. That's all the time we've got for today. Thank you both for your insight. Howard, we're, we're going to work on this. Thank you to our viewers for tuning in. You can follow all of our coverage on these issues in coming weeks at militarytimes.com. We'll see you next time. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.